Welcome to the Easy Med channel where medical topics are made easy. Today we're going to be talking about how to best approach the patient with shortness of breath. As always on Easy Med, you're going to be given simple tricks and strategies to remember the content. And today you're going to be given a simple mnemonic to remember the main emergent causes to shortness of breath. Let's start this off by looking at how many things can cause shortness of breath. If you take a look, there's a lot of potential causes. And to complicate matters, some of these are emergent while others are less urgent and they can be managed outpatient and you might be in a position where you have to be able to distinguish between the two. This can create a lot of pressure because you don't wanna miss something bad. Well, this video is gonna help provide you with the necessary tools to best approach the patient with shortness of breath in an organized fashion. The first step with any new patient that presents to you is performing a primary survey. This will include assessing the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. Airway and breathing are particularly important, especially in shortness of breath, so make sure you adequately assess it and take action as necessary. This could include things like supplemental oxygen, BiPAP or CPAP, breathing treatments, or even intubation if appropriate. Take a look at the patient as a whole. Do they appear sick or not sick? The patient should be getting an EKG immediately on arrival. And as all of this is going on, pay attention to the patient's vital signs. Take a look at their blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, oxygen saturation. The patient will also need to be hooked up to cardiac monitor and pulse oximetry, and an IV should be established. All of these things are gonna be going on concurrently. You don't have to go in this particular order, but what's important is you wanna perform an adequate primary survey on any new patient, especially one with shortness of breath. Now that we have performed that primary survey, if the patient is stable and time allows, you can perform a chart review on the patient. This will include taking a look at their age and gender, review their vital signs, take a look at their medication list, review their past medical, surgical, family, and social history, see if they've been seen before for shortness of breath, and if so, what was done at that time and what were they diagnosed with? Review any previous EKGs or cardiac catheterizations. You can also review any previous imaging, especially those that pertain to shortness of breath, like a chest x-ray, CT chest, or echocardiogram. A chart review is a great way to better understand the patient before you go and get that history. I will caution you though, don't let it form premature bias or closure. You do want to go in open-minded, that way you don't miss anything bad. So now that we have performed that primary survey and possibly that chart review, it's time to start getting the history from the patient. And before we start talking about the history, I do wanna go over this mnemonic. So there are a lot of things that can cause shortness of breath. And while you obtain that history, you're gonna to wanna to elicit information that helps you prioritize that differential. Well, it can be challenging to remember all of those causes to shortness of breath, especially the emergent ones. So this mnemonic is gonna help with that. The mnemonic is fittingly breathe, and it's gonna help you remember the main interthoracic causes to shortness of breath. B stands for bacteria. This will help you remember pneumonia and endocarditis. R stands for reactive airway disease. And even though this is a generalized term that describes wheezing, I use it here to describe things that cause obstruction or bronchospasm, such as asthma, COPD, or anaphylaxis. E stands for embolism. That will help you remember pulmonary embolism. A stands for acute coronary syndrome to help you remember MI as a cause of shortness of breath. T stands for tension pneumothorax or tamponade to help you remember cardiac tamponade. H stands for heart failure. Lastly, E stands for electrical excitation to help you remember arrhythmias. You can also use that E if you want to remember effusion to help you out with pleural effusions. Hopefully this mnemonic gives you an easy way to remember the main interthoracic emergencies that can lead to shortness of breath. It's not to say that other things can't become emergent, and there's also extrathoracic causes that lead to shortness of breath as well, but these are the main emergencies. Now it's time to finally get that history. You're gonna use that history to refine and prioritize that long differential diagnostic list because there's a lot of things that can lead to shortness of breath. I think it's important to first let the patient communicate all their concerns and symptoms to you. Don't ask too many questions and don't interrupt them. Then once they have communicated everything to you, you can ask them more questions to figure out what's going on. You can first start by asking questions that pertain to the breathe diagnoses. So for example, maybe they're having productive cough and they have a history of recent fevers and you're worried about pneumonia. Or maybe they have worsening shortness of breath with exertion, and maybe you're worried about an ACS component. Or maybe they've had worsening lower extremity edema, and you know they have a history of CHF, and they could be presenting with an exacerbation of their heart failure. So you're gonna use that to help refine your differential. Then you can broaden it out and perform a review of systems to ask questions about other organ systems that could be contributing to their shortness of breath. So now that the history is complete, you're going to perform a thorough physical examination. And this involves more than just listening to the heart and lungs. In addition to auscultation, take a look at the oropharynx. Also take a look at the patient's jugular veins. Some things that can cause jugular venous distension include pneumothorax from increased interthoracic pressure, cardiac tamponade, and heart failure to name a few. 
Assess the patient's overall breathing. Are they using accessory muscles? Perform an abdominal exam and assess the patient's periphery for any edema. Now that the history and physical exam is complete, you should have a pretty good prioritized differential list. And now it's time to start working up the patient. Here are some example lab considerations. It really depends on what your differential is to determine what you're gonna order. For example, if you're concerned about a cardiac etiology, you're probably gonna get some basic labs plus a troponin, or maybe the patient has a history of heart failure and you're concerned about an exacerbation and you feel like a BNP might be helpful. Maybe the patient has some risk factors for a PE, but they're low enough risk so you're gonna start off with the D-dimer. These are just a few examples, but the point is it really depends on what your differential is and that will help you decide what kind of labs you're gonna order. You should also consider getting imaging if you feel it's appropriate. Most patients with shortness of breath, you're at least gonna consider getting a chest X-ray. We talked about the EKG before during the primary survey, but remember to consider that when the patient arrives. You might also need a more comprehensive test like a CT chest. And then if you have experience with ultrasound, you could perform a bedside ultrasound and look for signs of pneumothorax, pericardial effusion, tamponade physiology, signs of pneumonia, CHF, pleural effusion. You could take a look at the IVC. You could get different cardiac measurements if you have experience. So there's a lot of different options here. There are some risk stratification and assessment tools that are out there that can be used for patients with shortness of breath. We're not gonna go into too much detail in this video. The EasyMed blog that correlates with this video, which I'll link below in the description, goes in much more detail. So if you wanna learn more about this, I encourage you to go check out the blog. What you see listed here are two examples. These are not the only two. There are many more assessment tools and risk stratification scores that are out there. So I encourage you to check out that blog if you want more information. Let's wrap this up with some example presentations that commonly show up on board exams and medical tests. You're gonna be given a case scenario with keywords or phrases that are commonly used in question stems that correlate with the diagnosis. Try to figure out what that diagnosis is. It's not to say this is how all patients present, but this is how it's commonly tested. So if you get a patient with crushing, squeezing, chest pain, radiation to their jaw, they're diaphoretic, they're nauseous, the pain improves with rest and they're short of breath, what are you gonna think about? This one's pretty easy. You're gonna think about acute coronary syndrome. If you're presented a patient who's short of breath, they're complaining of sharp pleuritic chest pain with cough or deep inspiration. Maybe they have unilateral leg swelling. Or maybe they have a history of recent travel or surgery or hormonal use. What are you gonna think about here? This is an example of pulmonary embolism. Next, if you get a patient with sudden onset, short of breath, sharp pain, recent trauma or coughing, you're gonna consider a pneumothorax. If the patient complains of productive cough, fever, generalized weakness, you're gonna think about pneumonia. Next, if you get a patient with current jelly sputum and they have a history of alcohol use, consider Klebsiella pneumonia. If the patient has pneumonia plus diarrhea, this is a buzzword for Legionella. What about if you get a patient who has a history of smoking, they have wheezing, they have a barrel chest and they're cachectic, they have pursed lip type breathing, what are you gonna be thinking about here? This is gonna be COPD. Next, if the patient has a headache, they're nauseous, they're short of breath, maybe they're altered, and other family members or pets have similar presentations, what are you gonna think about here? This is carbon monoxide poisoning. Next, if you have bilateral lower extremity pitting edema and they're short of breath, you're gonna consider things like CHF. All right, we have three more examples here. Next is a patient with ascending weakness, they're short of breath, they have a history of recent diarrhea, maybe from Campylobacter, what are you gonna consider here? This is Guillain-Barre. Next is a patient with different neurological symptoms in space and time, history of optic neuritis and they're short of breath. You're gonna consider MS. And then the last one is weakness with prolonged activity and they're also short of breath. This is myasthenia gravis. Hopefully this provided you an organized approach to the patient with shortness of breath. If you found the video content useful, please consider subscribing to the EasyMed channel. That way you don't miss out on future videos that make medicine easy. Thanks for watching and hope you check out future videos.